Good morning, and welcome to the first in a series of web events about culture and behavior in the financial services industry hosted by the New York Fed. My name is Tom Noon. I work in the New York Fed's legal group and serve on several committees whose projects are the subject of today's panel discussion. The views I express, however, are my own, not necessarily those of the New York Fed, its sponsored committees, or the Federal Reserve System. This morning, we will discuss two projects in which staff from the New York Fed have worked with members of the financial services industry to promote ethical standards, improve conduct, and earn the public's trust in the honesty, reliability, and competence of financial services professionals. My thanks, as ever, to Honora O'Neill for that framing. The first project is a set of case studies published last week by the Education and Industry Forum on Financial Services Culture. That's a committee of academics and industry professionals with a shared interest in promoting a greater awareness of ethics and finance. The second is the FX Global Code, already in its third year. Today, you will hear from members of the New York Fed's Foreign Exchange Committee and Financial Markets Lawyers Group about a timely review of the principles published three years ago and about ongoing work to engage an array of participants in the international foreign exchange market. Now, John Williams, the New York Fed's president and CEO, would like to add his greeting. Yeah, thanks, Tom, and good morning and welcome everyone uh, to today's event. Honestly, I wish I was able to greet you all in the, the auditorium at the New York Fed as we usually do, but I am glad that we're able to find a way to continue these vital conversations at least in a virtual format. So I hope that wherever you are, you're safe and healthy and that we can meet in person again soon. The world's changed and so have the way we host our conferences, but our work on culture continues. The initiatives you'll hear more about today are the result of really close collaboration between industry, academics, and my colleagues here at the New York Fed, who are all committed to raising standards and maintaining public trust in financial services. The recently published case studies by the Education and Industry Forum on Financial Services Culture and the work on the FX Global Code share the common theme of building ethical norms and training people to recognize ethics in their own decision making. So thank you to everyone who contributed to those and who are taking the time today to share their insights with us. Creating a positive work culture is challenging and ongoing work. It's critical that we look for ways to adapt to a changing world, especially now against the backdrop of a global pandemic when many are working remotely. While creating and maintaining a good culture was always important, there should be a new sense of urgency when we approach these topics and think about the path forward. Our working lives have changed dramatically and suddenly, so our thinking and culture must evolve and adapt as well. So it's a good time to ask ourselves, are, these, are there new or different scenarios that we should be studying? Uh, have the risks and opportunities that we should be looking at and examining change? The purpose of today is to learn and to discuss now, I'll turn it back to Tom, because I'm really looking forward to hearing this session and, and getting uh, moving ahead on this. Uh, but I would like to uh, really remind everybody that we want to hear from you. Feel free to reach out to the committee to share your own experiences. By telling stories, we'll, your, your stories will continue to make progress and spark change. I'm excited for what I know will be an interesting discussion. So, um, Tom, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, John. It's an honor to introduce this morning's panelists. Bill Bolding is Dean and J.B. Fuqua Professor of Business Administration at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, and he's a member of the New York Fed's Education and Industry Forum. Together with Peg Sullivan from Morgan Stanley, Bill wrote the case study, Tech and Research, which the New York Fed published last Thursday. Emmanuel Burry, another member of the Education and Industry Forum, is the Chief Compliance Officer for BNP Paribas Americas. Emmanuel wrote the case study, Conduct After Hours, with Daniel Warren from Rutgers Business School. Maria Duvas is a Managing Director in Morgan Stanley's Legal and Compliance Division. She's a member of the New York Fed's Foreign Exchange Committee and Financial Markets Lawyers Group, each of which contributed to the FX Global Code. Maria is also a member of the New York Fed's Alternative Reference Rates Committee, which guides the U.S. transition from LIBOR. Anna Nordstrom is a Senior Vice President in the New York Fed's Markets Group and Deputy Head of the Market Operations, Monitoring, and Analysis Function 
overseeing international markets. In this role, she oversees the Foreign Reserves Management Directorate and the Foreign Exchange and Global Markets Directorate. Anna is responsible for the New York Fed's Foreign Exchange Committee and its work on the FX Global Code and represents the New York Fed on the Global Foreign Exchange Committee. Finally, Jackie Welch is the Chief Human Resources Officer and Chief Diversity Officer of Freddie Mac and a member of the New York Fed's Education and Industry Forum. Together with Christina Skinner of the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, Jackie wrote the case study Grabbing Coffee, which was also published last Thursday. Thank you very much, Bill, Emmanuel, Maria, Anna, and Jackie, for volunteering for this panel and for all the work you've done on the case studies and the FX Global Code. Let's begin with the case studies. Emmanuel, can you tell us what the Education and Industry Forum is trying to accomplish by publishing case studies about ethical dilemmas? Yes, so good, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Tom, for your introduction. Um, so, so let me start maybe by thanking the New York Fed for having given us the opportunity to work collectively on the topical matter of ethics in the financial industry. Um, I do believe that the culture in the industry has broadly improved already through various levers, including enhanced code of conduct, as we will be discussing later. However, uh, anchoring the right ethical mindset in a sustainable manner in the industry requires further ethical standards. Um, the ambition of the EIF for me was, was more holistic than this. I mean, for all of us, I guess, not just for me, for all of us, was more holistic because it aims to embed ethical standards not only the, in the industry, but also in the education of the future leader of the industry. I mean, the best comparison that, that I can take um, and, and that we all will understand well for those who are in finance for, for some time, it's um, that uh, the, the, the students that we're training in finance are highly versed and, and well trained on many financial concepts, such as EBIT, return on equity, hedging, um, uh, or you know, uh, fun, other financial instruments. So they have to manage business cases during their studies that are driven to optimize the economic value of what they're doing. Um, they are not trained as deeply to think about the ethical impacts of decisions driven by financial considerations, nor to navigate the often complex dynamic between several objectives, nor feel comfortable to speak up in front of more senior people. So we all know that those matters are critical to ensure that the industry is really at the service of the society as is not serving other one-sided objectives. So it does require students and junior staff in the industry to be trained as early as possible through concrete cases that will engage them and arm them with a strong moral compass. Thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, Jackie, what drew you to the case study project? Uh, good morning. I'd like to join Emmanuel in offering my thanks uh, for the opportunity to be part of this very important work. And thank you to the Fed for convening us for this very important conversation. I'd also like to amplify Emmanuel's points about ethics as a mindset, because I think there is a long uh, fallacy, this notion of that we rise to the occasion. And I would argue that, in fact, we rise to our training. So it's important to Emmanuel's point that we offer up this content as a matter of training. I'd also say that as a matter of pedagogy, case studies are a productive device in adult learning. And through case studies, you know, we have the objectives to teach and cement learning as it relates to ethical behavior inside of financial services. The format of the case study studies gave us the opportunity to create time and space to explore a vast range of ethical dilemmas. Um, from real life um, experiences from our colleagues um, and gives us an opportunity to sort of consider these things and solve for them that's not always present real time and in real life. And I would also have to be fun. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Uh, Bill, what's the role of education in raising industry standards? And specifically, is it possible to teach ethics? So I, I think that the, the role of education is profoundly important. Uh, and of course, I've heard the question of, can you teach ethics uh, innumerable times? So I'm going to make a distinction between uh, values and ethics. 
which is to say that that one's values are probably pretty much in place uh, by the time you you join the workforce. But ethics, in some sense, uh, represents your ability to live up to those values. And so uh, what that means is that there's a critically important role of education in allowing one to to be true to, to one's own values. And I think it starts with the idea of many people go through life without really articulating what those values are. And I think it's it's very, very important that we do engage in the process of articulating our underlying values and then how that translates into a roadmap for ethical behavior. Then the the second critical thing is learning how to actually adhere to the values that, that one has identified. And there's some some really simple but very uh, critical things that one can learn through education, such as the slippery slope of small deviations from one's values, uh, the the really difficult situation of being in the heat of the moment, being under pressure, uh, being the deer in the headlights, so to speak. And here's where I'll simply reinforce what's been already said, which is uh, the, it, there's a reason why people practice uh, that, that you train for, uh, a symphony performance or an athletic competition that as you get in the heat of the moment, the benefits of that rehearsal means that you are prepared to actually stick to those values when it becomes a bit more challenging than, than when you're in the, the, the so-called domain of practice. So in that way, education is simply, uh, extremely important. Thanks, Bill. And I, I think I hear in your comment a consistent theme with what Emmanuel and Jackie were saying on the importance of muscle memory or habit, um, which I think is the core concept of ethics. Um, may I ask each of you very briefly, for the benefit of anyone who might like to work with the Education and Industry Forum on a case study, what's the process like of writing a case study? Working with you was entirely new to me as a lawyer, someone who never went to business school. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about that? And do you have any ideas in mind for future case studies? So uh, I'll, I'll jump in first. Uh, and something that I omitted to say in, in my opening remarks was to thank, uh, to thank you and John and, and the New York Fed for getting us engaged. And I think that there is really an enormous benefit uh, in terms of this collaboration between industry practitioners uh, the Fed and academics. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful to have been brought in as an academic into this process. And if you think about it, each of us brings something that's really important to, to this, this area of exploration. Uh, so for example, the practitioners bring the, the very important realities of the work environment. Uh, that the Fed brings the critical rules that are necessary to protect the integrity uh, of the financial system. And I think what academics bring is deep insight into human behavior, because ultimately what happens is going to depend on human behavior. But as you bring those three actors together, uh, it, it, that combination helps produce something that is extraordinarily difficult to achieve with an ethics case study. And so having, you know, having been an academic for so long, I know how hard it is to write a case study and especially an ethics case study because what you can get with this combination is to tease out scenarios that are both realistic and not obvious because this is, this is the really challenging thing is if it's non-realistic, then people dismiss it. And if it's too obvious, then it doesn't cause you to deeply reflect. And so what I think is so special about this combination is the ability to, to, generate these case studies that ultimately will lead to this reflection. As to the future, um, I think there will be innumerable opportunities um, as we keep people working together. Uh, and so I'm not going to say I've got a, a list of 10 things ready to go, but as we talk to each other, that's how those ideas emerge. And so that's the, the other added value of this combination. Thanks, Bill. Emmanuel, how about you? What's, what's it like from your perspective to, to work on these case studies with the Education and Industry Forum, 
and where would you like to see this project head? So, so um, I, you know, a, a lot has been said by Bill, but I would say I have enjoyed tremendously the fact of, um, you know, just coming together as experts with diverse backgrounds, um, gaining insight from um, from ethics teacher in particular for us who are in the industry, um, a serve a common goal also, and eventually co-construct co those um, training materials. Um, I, I believe we have all benefited from our interactions. Um, I found very interesting to build those cases because, indeed, as Bill said, they're not obvious. It's not so obvious to write them. When you read them afterwards, they seem a little bit, you know, quite up. They're not so obvious to write because they need to be realistic. Um, and, and I think that I've been also enjoying a lot to work on the teaching notes because this is something we miss in the industry. It's really to be able to raise the awareness of our staff through the right reasoning, and the teaching notes have been very important for me. I, I've loved working with Danielle on those topics. Um, the only thing I will add, maybe, Tom, is uh, for future cases, I feel we – so there's many, many things, of course, we could address. There's two areas that I'm particularly interested in the, the, seeing the, the, the work group um, uh, address. It's uh, everything that's related around AI, but also mainly all the, the – themes and thematics that the banking industry is facing um, in environmental dilemmas or social equality dilemmas in, in financing the economies. And I think there's a lot to work on um, in this, that area as well. Thanks, Emmanuel. And just to clarify, the, the case studies that the New York Fed um, published are available on the public website. The teaching manuals are available upon request for instructors at universities and at firms. Um, Jackie, over to you. Um, what was it like for you to work on the case studies, and what would you like to see happen? Yeah, Bill and Emmanuel did such a fantastic job pretty much laying out anything I could add that is of value. I would say for me, first and foremost, having an amazing writing partner, as I did with Christina Skinner, is an absolute must. Um, sort of that symbiotic relationship and, and, and getting to a place where we both felt like this is representative of our thoughts. Um, I found the process very challenging in a good way. We talk a lot about inclusion and diversity and all the upsides, uh, but there is an underbelly. Everything has an underbelly. And one of the underbellies of a, a, a very diverse team is that you have a lot of perspectives to work through. In the end, you get a product that you wouldn't get if you work with a monolithic group. But I would say anyone wanting to work on a case study, be prepared for the methodical, slow nature of having a diverse team uh, with the hope that at the end you get a product you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So that would be the first thing. And I think from another challenge perspective, you know, you have these vast concepts and nuanced experiences that you want to make succinct and relatable. Um, and it seems easy. I mean, Emmanuel intimated to it exactly. Um, you, you don't want to make it obvious, but you want to make it thoughtful. There are all these sort of, you know, interplays of what you're trying to accomplish, and it's not as easy as you think. Um, and then in terms of the future, I would like to see a case study that deals with multi-generational workforces. You know, we talk about baby boomers who are extending their work lives simultaneous with young people coming in, and there's natural tension that's going to occur there. Um, and so I'd like to see us treat that in a case study format. Thanks, Jackie. Um, let's turn now to the FX Global Code. Maria, what are the objectives of the code? And after three years of experience, do you think the code is meeting those objectives? Good morning, Tom, and good morning, everyone. I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk about the FX code. Um, its creation was a Herculean undertaking. Um, uh, it involved a global effort of market participants from a diverse array of market segments and uh, numerous uh, central banks. Um, and it will iterate over time, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing that as well. But the purpose of the code is to provide a common set of guidelines for all FX market participants to abide by in order to have a fair, liquid, open, and transparent market that enhances FX market functioning. The code applies to all segments of the market, including sell side, buy side, non-bank liquidity providers, e-trading platforms, interdealer brokers, and other FX brokerage execution and settlement service providers. 
Reflecting on the code's objectives and whether these have been met since it was published three years ago, I can confidently say that there is broad market understanding of the code's purpose. And I think there's overall a common level of familiarity with many of the code's key principles, particularly in the execution and information sharing sections of the code as well as an expectation that dealers in particular will comply with the code's principles. Um, for example, the code's principles on robust governance and risk management processes have been beneficial to many market participants during the pandemic. Um, and I think the FX disclosures that are warranted under the code have provided a better understanding of practices during what were more difficult market conditions in March and April of this year. However, I do think there may be a misperception that the code serves its mission if it's adopted by the dealer community, and that it isn't as critical to have a broader array of market participants adhere, which really isn't the case given that a pro-competitive market is the code's goal. Thanks, Maria. An important point about uh, conduct during March and April of this year. Um, Anna, why was it important that the official sector and private sector work together on this project? And from the official sector's perspective, wouldn't it have been simpler just to pass a law or write a regulation? So thank you, Tom. Um, I'm very excited to be on this panel and um, to also start on the panel with Maria, who has been um, an incredible partner in the development of the Global Code. Um, so in terms of collaboration, I think we feel that collaboration between the public and private sector helps us make sure that the code is relevant. And this makes it more likely that the code is also adopted across the industry. So I would say that for best practices to be successful, it is very important that we work together with the industry, with those um, players that are active in the foreign exchange market. So um, I think we really find this collaboration incredibly important. And that was the experience that we had during the development of the global code, which, as Maria said, was, was um, quite an incredible undertaking. So I would stress one point here, which has already been raised by several uh, panel members already, and that is that when we develop the code, we also wanted to make sure that we capture the diversity of the industry, of market participants in this market. I would say that the spectrum of, the spectrum of buy side institutions in particular is very complex and varied, and the size and complexity of their FX market activities, how they engage in the marketplace, differ significantly. So we were very focused on reflecting this diversity in the development of the code when we put together the market participants group that would support us in the official sector in the development of the code. Um, in terms of the regu regulation, and this is a question we often get, so isn't it better to just pass uh, a law or regulation? I think here I would just note that uh, the FX market is a global market with many different regulatory regimes and approaches. So a regulatory approach on a global level would be quite complex and challenging. And another point on the code here and best practice is that, that, that the global code is principles based, which translates better into a global market and global context. So I would say that we look at best practices as complementing laws, regulations, or supervisory channels for that matter. And we look at best practices as serving as guideposts for the market um, for responsible market conduct and conventions. And, and in this way, we think that they they help cultivate fair and effective markets. Thanks, Anna. I'd like to put a marker on the subject of geography and differences um, in regional standards and expectations for now. Um, and then we'll come back to that a little bit later because that's an important issue. Um, Marie, if I could ask you first, what's on the agenda for the three-year review of the FX Global Code? 
So the Global Foreign Exchange Committee, or GFXC, which oversees the code and is comprised of representatives from regional central bank-sponsored committees, such as the New York Foreign Exchange Committee, has been focusing its three-year review of the code on four main topics, buy-side engagement, improvements in disclosures, anonymous trading platforms, and algorithmic trading. It's also taking a fresh look at the execution section of the code in order to determine whether any enhancements are warranted, such as with respect to last look, agent versus principal, and pre-hedging. Um, as I mentioned, one area of focus is algorithmic trading. In light of the increasingly electronic nature of the FX market and reliance on algorithms to execute trades in this market, Consideration is being given to whether additional enhancements to the code are needed, both as to disclosures regarding an algorithm's purpose and performance, and how transaction cost analysis could be addressed in the code. And this is reflective of why the code is not meant to be static, um, and why the GFXC was created, in order to ensure that the code is fit for, fit for purpose. The FX market will iterate over time, and so will the code. Um, finally, I'd also like to mention that the GFXC is considering whether further enhancements are needed to the netting and settlement processes section of the code um, in order to address possible trends um, highlighted in the 2019 BIS Triennial Survey which um, indicate that the proportion of FX trades being settled outside of payment versus payment systems, such as CLS, are increasing. Um, it's unclear whether any recommendations coming out of this review will be part of the 2020 code update or whether that work will continue beyond completion of that 2020 update. Thanks, Maria. And maybe there's Thanks, Maria. maybe there's an opportunity there. for collaboration with the Education and Industry Forum in light of Emmanuelle's comment that she'd like to see a case study about programming algorithms. Uh, Anna, you've devoted a lot of time recently to speaking with buy side market participants about the FX Global Code. From the official sector's perspective, why is it important for the buy side to adopt the FX Global Code? And can you tell us? what adoption of the code means in practice. So um, thank you for this question, uh, Tom. This is an important priority for uh, the GFXC and also us at the New York Fed. So I would first stress that um, the global code is voluntary. So as we discussed, it's not uh, regulation. It's a voluntary code. So this means that we do focus a lot um, on promoting adoption across the industry. So that's work undertaken at the GFXC and also at the local level from local foreign exchange committee. Our view is the code is only effective in strengthening standards truly across the industry if all market participants embrace it. So when we look at the buy side, the take up on the buy side has been positive, but it's been a little bit slower and there can be a number of reasons for that. Uh, one aspect is of course the diversity of, of the buy side, which makes it a little bit more challenging, perhaps with the outreach. But um, we really find that getting the buy side across the spectrum to, to adopt the code is really important for really fully embedding the code in the industry. And we believe that there are many reasons why um, the code is relevant for the buy side. Um, so and just highlighting a few, um, so the code promotes transparency, which improves outcomes for clients. And also direct involvement in the code makes them better informed and also allows them po to pose more challenging questions and know what to expect from their counterparts when they um, transact in the marketplace. And generally, I would say it sends a signal to all stakeholders that the firm is um, abiding by industry best practices, that is support support such a marketplace. So in terms of what adoption looks like, um, well, it can be different for different firms. And again, here, the diversity um, of market participants play a role in how it will, what it will look like when they start the process of adoption. 
So one thing we stress importantly in the code is, um, is high-level principles. So the code is proportional to the nature, size, and complexity of the firm's engagement in the ethics industry. So that means that while we truly believe that the code applies to all who act in the ethics market, the details of precisely how it applies to each individual firm may differ. So as a first step, it's important for a firm to, to really review the principles of the code and, they, and then look at those principles and look at how they engage in the ethics market and identify which principles apply directly to their business. So it's a really individual um, exercise um, to start out with, depending on the firm's engagement in the market. So once it has done so and identified the relevant principles, then it should look at those principles and conduct a gap analysis against its internal processes and procedures. And then look to where they do have gaps, and then they undertake an effort to close those gaps. And the final step in this process would be to publicly communicate um, ad adherence to the code by um, signing a statement of commitment and publish a statement of commitment. And we look at this public acknowledgement as a very important aspect of the support of the code, um, communicating that a firm recognizes the code as industry best practices and that it has undertaken the work to align its internal processes and procedures. I would note this is also a process that we have undertaken at the New York Fed. Um, so, so this is in broad strokes what um, the process would look like. Thanks, Anna. It's important to emphasize the role that buy side firms can play in improving standards. Maria, from your perspective on the sell side, why is it important that buy side firms adopt the FX Global Code? Well, the only way, it's, it's, it's really what I had mentioned earlier, the only way for the FX market, which is one of the few global markets in the world to be pro-competitive, is to have all the key constituencies engage in a manner that meets the FX Code's objectives. A global market needs a global standard, and that can't easily be created at the local level or by just imposing standards on only one segment of the market. All need to know that when they engage, they can expect those they interact with to do the same um, using the same ethical and behavioral standards. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Anna, what are the two or three greatest obstacles to buy-side adoption and what do you say to buy-side firms struggling with those issues? So um, we have spent um, quite a lot of time at the New York Fed um, in engaging with the buy-side to understand where the struggles with adoption lies. And I would also note that the GFXC has a working group, a buy-side working group. So um, the GFXC is also on a global level spent quite a lot of time engaging to identify these obstacles. So it's a real priority. And from, from this outreach, um, we've, um, the main hurdles really relate to, um, I think, three general buckets. So one is the perceived relevance to a firm. Um, another is the resource commitment that the firm needs to, um, to take on when it goes through the adoption process. And then the general familiarity with the code. So I would say, I would just note a couple of um, issues here. So one is that it is really important to be clear that if a firm engages in the wholesale ethics industry, it, the code is relevant to their business. Uh, we recognize that, that all principles are not relevant to each firm. Mm -hmm. As I noted earlier, the, the firm has to review the principles of the code and, and identify which are directly relevant to the way that they engage in the industry. So again, this is the proportionality of the code. So this is something that, that a firm uh, should keep in mind. So the code does re recognize this proportion, uh, this diversity. And here, the GFXC, we, um, we have developed a number of educational tools to help firms 
uh, approach adoption of the code. So, we're, so we recommend firms to go on the GFXS website, and there's a whole packet of information there that they can utilize when they um, start the adoption process. Another point that I would like to highlight here is that the firms should really think about this from the point of view of the benefits of the market as a whole and the market in which they operate. So the resource commitment to their adoption process should really be weighed against the benefits of operating in a market that is fair, transparent, and effective. And this is beneficial for buy-side market participants. And again, the proportionality, again, should also help alleviate some of the work with adoption for each individual firm. So for example, a firm that has a smaller FX footprint may find that fewer principles directly apply and that the, that the work to, um, to close gaps may be, may be a little bit more limited than, than a much larger firm that has a, a breadth of FX activities. So we think that the, the resource commitment is probably proportionate to a firm's uh, footprint and engagement in the marketplace. So again, at the, sorry, at the GFXC, we'll be looking at how we can do more to assist firms in this process. Thanks very much, Anna. And I'd like to return now to that uh, marker about geography that I mentioned in response to your earlier comment and turn to Emmanuel, um, whom I've just volunteered, I think, to work with Maria Dubas on the next case study. Um, Emmanuel, let's step back for a moment and consider how the case study project and the FX Global Code overlap. Uh, both projects aim to bring together members of the industry to work on ethics. Do you think that ethical standards in financial services need to be global. What room is there, in your opinion, for regional variation? So it's, a, it's a complex question, uh, I think, and, I, and I'm, I'm just going to offer a few reflections, but I think it, it definitely deserves probably a little deeper um, involvement from, from many specialists. Um, my, my, I would like maybe just to start by reminding um, a little bit what, what we're talking about when we're talking about culture and, and the way we do business, because it's all about interactions between individuals, uh, mainly. There are obviously policies and procedures, but there's also just the fact that we do um, uh, do activities and business by, by discussing with others uh, inside a firm and with other firms. So I would say that the, the, the culture of the industry is made of several components. Um, you may, you have behaviors, uh, of people that can be, you, you know, people can be bullying, people can be one-sided, uh, um, um, uh, in terms of objectives. People can have a tendency to hide information if they don't feel comfortable with something instead of, of discussing it openly and transparently. And we're coming back to all the, the, you know, the, 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 the various, um, I would say levers that have been addressed by Anna in the fourth, uh, code of conduct that needed to be addressed in terms of transparency and, 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 um, um, and, and which allows fairness. So you have all those behaviors, which are already things that in the interaction can happen and you can have people in a firm, the people that may be involved in those behaviors or targeted are not just the only thing that counts. The other thing that counts is all the others that see something and actually accept it, let it happen um, without saying anything. And all those behaviors, in addition to come back to your point about regional specificities, is also linked to education, your cultural environment. Um, it's um, linked to um, uh, also our personal events um, in our lives because this also matters. Um, we see it. I mean, when we actually witness cases that we have to solve, that are ad hoc cases about people that we have to discipline, we see that personal events can also influence, as well as education. Really, education is also absolutely critical. So I, I'm just taking this preamble because I think it's important. Um, Human beings are subject to contingencies. That's, that's really what we all need to be aware of. We should not forget that. And providing a normative ethical framework is important to try to, to mitigate the risk of those contingencies influencing the way business is done. So the, the answer I would like to bring to your question, Tom, is to say, for me, based on that assumption or that, I would say, reality, I think the ethical guidance 
um, needs to be based on ethical principles that are universal um, because they are there to to uh, eliminate as much as possible the things that can just come up from more individual or local uh, kind of drivers. Um, uh, so the, the ethical principles should be universal. Um, they, they should be, and, and a little bit like in the, in the Forex Code of Conduct, it was highly expected by most traders um, to actually get those uh, guidelines to, to know how they needed to conduct business after all the fines happened, because sometimes some people are not necessarily, they're just, they just need that guidance. It's not necessarily that they want to do wrong, but they need that guidance. So I, the, the, I'm insisting on this because same in AI, there are already some principles that are set, but I think, so it's already some, some high level principles for coders to follow. Uh, but we certainly have to do much more in particular in the financial industry where AI is, is used a, a lot. So whilst allowing for some variation in the implementation, the same way that there can be several answers, I mean, probably not 10, but two or three different answers to the case studies we've been working on, and we see that. There may be several answers to business dilemmas. So you may have some variation in implementation, but the principles should absolutely be universal. And I think we even need to go back to, and I, that's my, for my, um, um, I would say, college uh, colleagues that, that to say, but I, I would tend to, you know, be influenced by the principles and the ideas shared by, by Emmanuel Kant in, in the 18th century about, you know, the categorical imperative of, of uh, ethics in terms of behavior in the society. So I think we have a lot there, and that needs to remain one backbone for everyone. Um, it's particularly important for an industry like the banking industry, which by essence is highly international and highly complex, to offer a common set of moral reasoning codes um, to, to help the business to be performed in, in, in a manner that services, you know, the societies in the economies without too many bias that are linked to education and, and, uh, and local culture. Thanks, Emmanuel. And Honora O'Neill is going to be thrilled that you mentioned Emmanuel Kant. Um, I think your point about seeing something but not saying something is really critical. And it reminds me of comments that Preet Bharara made about the culture of silence in a speech at the New York Fed's Culture Conference a couple of years ago. And that speech is available on the New York Fed's public website. Um, I'd like to combine a couple of the audience Q&As now into a question for Jackie. Um, Jackie, it's really great that we're spending all of this time working on promulgating standards through the global code and promoting discussions about ethics through the case studies. Um, but how do you go from written standards and discussions to putting ethics into practice? Uh, thank you very much for the nuanced one and trying to make it succinct. I would say two words needing to have a communication plan that supports their ethics program, and that communication should be ongoing. It cannot be one and done. And I think you have to think about structurally how do we embed ethics as part of our operating model. So from a human resources perspective, I think, for example, when we are um, out in the marketplace recruiting new talent and we put them through our rigorous interview processes to ensure that they, uh, what they say on their resume actually squares up with what they're able to do, but we don't take that as an opportunity to pro for ethics. A simple question like, give me a time in your career where you were faced with an ethical dilemma. What was it and how'd you handle it? How would you do it differently? To get a sense of, from a moral compass, accountability perspective, who is this person? And will they add to the, the culture of ethics that we're trying to build? I think also the ongoing training is very, very important. And I think case studies are a great way to do it. Um, and you can have learning interventions that are both in person. Now we're in this virtual world. It can be virtual. But again, the whole idea of it not being a one and done. Uh, thanks, Jackie. And I think your point about um, asking a question on ethics during interviews is a critical one. In mm -hmm. addition, because it signals the importance of that issue to the organization. Um, Maria, yeah. Um, Maria, could I ask you the same question? How do you go from principles to practice? So I think um, a firm needs to look at the principle and consider what policies, procedures, and controls it has in place to ensure that it and its personnel are going to abide by that principle. So it's not enough just to have a policy. 
right? As Jackie said, you need to train your personnel periodically on that policy. And it also may not necessarily be enough to simply train on a policy. It may make sense to have surveillance tools in place that can look for certain activities, such as um, surveillance of trading activity or communications of personnel. And then I think the last thing I would say is that businesses change over time. And so a one-time review of a principal may not be enough. And a one-time review of those controls and policies and procedures may not be enough. Um, a firm should consider periodically reviewing um, its policies, its procedures, and its controls. And it should also consider how frequently should training be conducted. And um, does it make sense to provide disclosures to counterparties about how it engages in the market? Um, and that is something certainly that the code addresses, which I think has been quite helpful to the market um, for purposes of understanding what are some practices um, as they relate to FX market activity. Thanks, Maria. And your answer really responds as well to a question we've gotten from the audience that I want to read now. What are the panelists' views on the relationship between ethics and the discipline of compliance? Um, maybe I could turn back to Emmanuel for her views on that question. Uh, well, I think that the, the relationship is extremely tied, but I would say, so there, there's many things we could answer to that question, but I think the, the, the key thing is for me is that ethics is, is the, the, the responsibility of everyone in the firm. Um, it's absolutely everyone. It's not, uh, so, so uh, at least it's the way we see it uh, at Bean Forever, and it's what we're trying to convey is that it's really the job of everyone. And I'm insisting a lot on the fact that compliance is a control function within the industry. Uh, we have, of, of course, we, we define, uh, we give guidelines. Um, so there are guidelines that can be set, you know, like the forest code of conduct, and then we would actually be the one discussing with the business on how we implement that. But so we would have a local uh, a guideline for our, our firm specifically um, on that. But the responsibility is the one of the business. So it's critical that the business has fully understood what it means to be ethical. Hope Thanks, Emmanuel. It does, and I think that's one of the reasons why the FX code was so promising, that it's really the business line that helped uh, develop it. Uh, let me turn to Bill now. Um, Bill, one lesson that I take from the case studies and the global uh, FX code is that there are fruitful areas for collaboration between the academy, the industry, and the official sector. What other areas do you think are ripe for this kind of collaboration? So let me let me back up for a moment in answering that question. Uh, it was actually a question from Bill Dudley, uh, John's predecessor, that originally got me involved in working with the New York Fed. And the question was, uh, do business schools need to take responsibility uh, for the ethical and legal violations happening on Wall Street in the aftermath of the of the financial crisis. And, of course, the observation from within the New York Fed was, huh, a lot of these people who are being caught up in, in, in these bad behaviors actually are business school graduates. Uh, so my response to that question was, yes, absolutely, business schools have to take responsibility. And we have a responsibility to the financial services sector to produce graduates with uncompromising integrity that will do the right thing when everyone is watching, but perhaps more importantly, do the right thing when no one is watching. And so uh, in, in terms of getting to that point, my view was that business schools needed to work collaboratively with the Fed and with industry practitioners to create a culture shift, and, and this in, in some ways touches on the, the previous question you asked, which is a culture shift from one of a compliance culture, which is we just need to check the boxes around compliance, um, which leads to challenges, which is you may check one box, but we can't have a, we can't cover every contingency, and therefore if your goal is simply to comply, 
you could get yourself in deep trouble. And what we really need is a transition from a compliance culture to an ethical culture of trust that builds confidence that the financial services sector will live up to its noble role in society. And in order to get there, I believe there's plenty of work to be done. And the critical thing here I would emphasize is work to be done together uh, in collaboration with the, with the Fed, with practitioners in achieving this goal of building the kind of ethical culture of trust that will rebuild public trust in this, in this system, which is so foundational to well-being. Thanks. I, I agree entirely, Bill, that, you know, from a firm's perspective, you can't have a compliance rule to address every scenario. From the official sector's perspective, you can't have a law or regulation to address every scenario. And that's why uh, having a culture that values ethics is really important. Bill, can I stick with you just for a minute for an audience question? Um, and it is, many ethical dilemmas are rarely presented in binary terms. Often decisions are commonly made via a series of small incremental steps, which often obscure the ethical questions. How do the panelists suggest that this issue be identified and addressed? Well, that's a, that's a really wonderful question, and it, it highlights what we know to be the case in terms of why people find themselves in ethical trouble, which is um, it's, not, it's not the bang, bang, you know, I cross some uh, very bold line and engage in, in behavior that, that was a, a terrible violation. It's these small steps. And, uh, and you, you take one step and then you take another step and there is this slippery slope that ultimately leads to serious violations of, of trust. And so this is where, uh, I think, first of all, we have to help people understand that it don't think in terms of these, these big issues. Think in terms of the smaller things that will get you in trouble and why it is discipline is so important in the small things to avoid getting into the big, uh, big challenge areas. But the other thing is I'll, I'll just give a shout out to the importance of these case studies, which is simply to highlight um, that it is these, these small incremental steps. And some of these cases are written in a way where you go to you know, part A, part B, part C, and so on um, as you move through the scenario and you begin to realize, huh, it was that thing that I did at the beginning that set me on a path that then led to another step, another step, and another step, and now now I've got problems. And so it's really important to educate people on these uh, on these small steps and how one can be proactive in thinking about how you appropriately decompose ethical dilemmas. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we've got just about a minute left, and Anna, can I turn to you for the last question? Um, and very quickly, can you tell us um, when will we know that we're successful in these projects? So um, this is a hard, um, this is something that's very hard to quantify, but I'll just start by saying that effective cultural change is a collective effort and that requires a lot of time and resources as, as is clear from the discussion in this panel. And we think that the effectiveness should be measured um, on a systemic, um, through a systemic change in how we view and think about these issues. If we take the code, um, we think that uh, one measure of success is the level of focus and interest it has elicited in the industry, how prevalent it has become in the discourse, um, both in the pu uh, private and public channels. If we look at uh, industry events, since the code was published. Um, the code is part, is part of the agenda, the st standard item of the agenda. It is discussed um, uh, throughout the industry at these events and also between uh, firms. And we look at uh, particular principles are, are discussed, uh, for example, last look and pre-hedging that were two of the principles that were most uh, challenging in the development. So we think that this discourse and engagement and discussing the code is one measure of, of success. And we think that this is a change from when we had local uh, best practices to right. when we move to global best practices. Thank you, Anna. And, and I agree, uh, shifting the discussion maybe isn't the final goal, but it's a sign we're moving in the right direction. Um, let me turn the floor now to John Williams, the New York Fed's president, for some concluding remarks. 
Yeah, thanks, Tom, and, and thanks to everybody. I mean, it's been a fascinating conversation. And I, I remember when we started on this, you know, uh, path to do the case studies and, and bringing together, you know, people from, you know, business schools and the practitioners and everybody. Uh, it was an exciting uh, project, and it's great to see that come come together. But I just have a couple of remarks. First of all, you know, again, this is a great work. I think great progress. We're in a Pandemic is really hard for us to, um, you know, engage in our uh, normal conference and other kind of uh, activities. But I think this webinar, which is of course a sequence of webinars, is uh, a great uh, way to do it uh, in given the situation. So I, I wrote a few notes down, Tom. I'm just going to highlight what I uh, things that I thought were really uh, uh, striking. Uh, you know, one is that, you know ethics is, is, as a mindset, and, and I, you know we've talked about this in previous conferences that when you think about culture. You don't get to have, you know, a culture for ethics, a culture for risk uh, management, a culture for, you know, everything else. You, you have one culture, and it, it really is about mindsets. Um, and obviously, that gets into issues, uh, as Jackie said, about training, but much more about and about communication uh, in uh, uh, throughout the institution. The second was this issue of articulating values. I thought that was a really important point that. Um, you know, I was told many years ago that you know every 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 institution has values. The question is, are the one are they the ones you want to have? And uh, understanding what those are, coming to and uh, and communicating that, and, and really making sure that everything you do is consistent with that, I think is is really uh, an important one. The other, I'm turning to you know some of the issues about the FX Global Code. I thought this idea that I think underlies a lot of this work is really about the principles based uh, aspect of how we do our work. Not just there, but you know more generally. Uh, and the last uh, takeaway, which I kind of started with with my you know, very brief opening remarks, is that the world is changing. Technology is changing it. Um, you know, the, the global economy, the pandemic is changing things, and we really need to be uh, you know re re regularly reviewing, reassessing, reevaluating our efforts around culture, around conduct, uh, and making sure that they are uh, adapting uh, and effective in this changing world. Last thing I'll just say is, you know, to me, this whole effort around uh, culture in the financial services sector, which, is, you know, obviously started, I think, about, about six years ago, um, and, um, you know, captures, I think, what we can do at the New York Fed more generally. And that's one is convene, bring together people from across, stakeholders from across uh, institutions, across the country, across the world, and, and engage on important issues. We can connect ideas uh, and research. Uh, and practices across those, and obviously uh, here catalyze uh, change and, and improvement. So to me, this represents a you know, obviously a continuing uh, effort by the New York Fed, working with all of you uh, to uh, uh, on these issues of uh, culture and financial services. So great, uh, great event today. I'm looking forward to our next one as well. Uh, with that, uh, Tom, I think I'll turn it back to you. Right on time. <laughs> thank you, John. Um, thank you, Bill, Emmanuel, Maria. Anna and Jackie for sharing your views. Um, thanks to all the staff at the New York Fed who put together this webinar, who work on the Bank's Culture Initiative, and who support the Education and Industry Forum, Foreign Exchange Committee, and the Financial Markets Lawyers Group. And I'd like to say a special thanks to Karen Bond, Aisha Call, and Carmi Recto. And thank you everyone for tuning in. The next webinar will take place on December 2nd, 2020. The topic will be trust and decision making. Please look out for a save the date email next month. That's all from the New York Fed. As my high school geometry teacher, Barbara O'Connell, used to say, have a good day and stay out of trouble. <laughs>